On the slide you see Chifan. Chifan couldn't be here today due to visa issues. He's back in the United States, so you get me instead. Here's what we do. We take a semantic layout as input. The semantic layout specifies the desired semantic class in every pixel. Uh, you see these semantic layouts on the left here. Um, the semantic classes are color-coded. Here the semantic classes are car, road, sidewalk, tree, building, street sign, street pole, etc. Our goal is to synthesize a photograph that has the layout specified in the input semantic label map. So there should be a car where the pixels are labeled car, there should be a tree where the pixels are labeled tree, there should be a building where the pixels are lab labeled building, and so forth. What you see on the right is the output of our approach. We synthesize these with a deep network, a single feed-forward pass in a convolutional uh, network. Our goal is that the output images look like photographs. They should be, ideally, indistinguishable from photographs. Our results are not yet indistinguishable from photographs, but they're quite good. Why do we want to do this? Our first motivation comes from computer graphics. What you see on the right are fairly typical images uh, generated by a real-time rendering engine. This is a state-of-the-art rendering engine, Unreal Engine 4. And you see that they're quite good. Computer graphics is doing well. But they're not indistinguishable from photographs. There's a cartoony appearance to them. The colors are not quite uh, right. The material properties are not quite right. We conjecture that direct image synthesis using deep networks can provide an alternative route to photorealism that can usefully complement existing computer graphics techniques. We don't think that approaches such as ours are going to replace rendering engines, but we think that, can, that they can usefully uh, complement existing rendering engines to enhance the realism of computer graphics imagery. Approaches such as ours are also very fast, so they can run in real time in conjunction with conventional computer graphics uh, rendering. Our second source of motivation is artificial intelligence, in particular the role of mental imagery and mental simulation in biological intelligence systems, animals, and humans. The precise role and the level of fidelity of mental imagery are a matter of debate, but we conjecture uh, that being able to imagine scenes in detail will be useful to artificially intelligent systems. Our approach is very direct. We train a convolutional network to synthesize an image. The network has uh, an architecture that we introduce in this work, the cascaded refinement network that I will describe in the next few slides. It's trained with a direct regression loss. It's a perceptual loss that I will also review. Also in the paper, uh, we have some uh, tricks to synthesize a diverse collection of images. So our network can synthesize not just a single image, but a collection of image that all conform to the desired layout, but have different appearance. The car might be white or might be red. It might be a daytime image. It might be a nighttime image. I will not review this in this presentation, but the details are in the paper, and I encourage you to, uh, to look at them. So the cascaded refinement network, this is the network that synthesizes the image. What you see on the screen is a single module of a CRN, of a cascaded refinement network. We have a module like this at every octave, every level of resolution. We start with very, very low resolution, four by eight. Uh, we feed in the downsampled label map, downsampled to eight by eight. It's taken through a number of convolutional layers, as you see here, and out comes out a, a set of feature maps at resolution four by, uh, four by eight. It's then upsampled, simple bilinear upsampling to uh, 8 by 16. These upsampled 8 by 16 feature maps are fed into this module at the next octave, the next resolution, 8 by 16, along with the downsampled label map, downsampled to 8 by 16. Taken through convolutional uh, layers at that resolution, out comes out 8 by 16 feature maps, upsampled to 16 by 32, fed into the module at the next resolution, along with the label map, downsampled to 16 by 32, and so on. 
um, we go up exponentially in resolution until we hit the desired resolution. We, in fact, output images at two megapixels, the full resolution of our training data. We didn't go up higher because we didn't have training data at higher resolution, but in principle, going up 2x in every dimension resolution is a matter of adding another module. So that's the architecture, very simple. We train it to regress activations in a visual perception network. You've already seen this idea in uh, the uh, previous presentation. I'll review it briefly. So the naive thing to do would be to just regress image color, to train uh, the network to match the colors in the ground truth image. That gives very, very bad results. Uh, that yields very blurry images. Instead, what we do, and what uh, many other works in this area do, is we match not just the colors, but we match the activations in a pre-trained perceiver network. We use the VGG network that looks at the ground truth image, and we do MRI on its brain. We capture its activations, and we try to synthesize an image that will induce the same brain activity, the same uh, activations, in the same pre-trained VGG network. This is not our idea. We have a small twist on it here and there, but by, but by and large, uh, the idea is present in many works in this area. It's a very good idea. It was introduced by Gattis and colleagues in their stylization work and popularized by Johnson and colleagues in their work on real-time super resolution and style transfer. So let's look at some results. What you're going to see is the input layout. You already see it on the screen. This is from the test set, and the prior results you saw were also from the test set, meaning these layouts are from cities that the network never saw during training. So these are novel layouts from places the network has never seen during training. What you're going to see next after the layout is the result uh, produced by a contemporaneous work by Isola et al, known as Pix to Pix, and after that, the result produced for this image by our approach. Okay, so this is the Pix to Pix result, and now you're going to see the result produced by our approach. Okay, let's do this a couple more times. So input layout, the image synthesized by Pix to Pix, and the image synthesized by our approach. One more time, input layout, pix to pix, our approach. We've done extensive quantitative comparisons uh, with pix to pix and a number of other baselines. What you see in the middle, uh, in the top middle, is our attempt to set up a GAN-based um, uh, system, which was not particularly successful. What you see in the bottom left is our result, and what you see on the right are two baseline architectures trained with the same perceptual loss. Overall, the architectures trained to directly synthesize images with the perceptual loss are doing better. Ours is the best, but the baseline architectures do reasonably well. So here uh, on the slide, you see results for the cityscapes data set. Um, we've also synthesized results for all the baselines and our system for the NYU data set uh, of indoor images. We've done uh, quantitative evaluations through pairwise comparisons where people had to, con uh, had to conduct A-B uh, B tests where they uh, rank um, and in, uh, out of a pair of images, they say which image is more, uh, more realistic. Everything is randomized, everything uh, is controlled, and we have released our script so that you can reproduce our results and also so that you can easily conduct similar A-B tests in your work. Uh, here, chances at 50%, 100 is great. It means that uh, people with 100% uh, percent reliability say that our images are more realistic, and uh, for, uh, for many baselines, um, the numbers are very high, uh, and you can look at the details in the paper. So we outperform all the baselines. 
Here are timed pairwise comparisons. This is an interesting experiment where you can see how long it takes people to see the differences. Uh, and turns out even in one eighth uh, of a second, uh, people rank our images as more realistic uh, than, uh, than baselines. Uh, our code is out, uh, it's been released along with all the uh, supporting scripts and data and you're welcome to use it. Thank you very much. Any questions? In this or in the other room? Please come to the microphone. Okay, maybe I have a question then. Sure. Uh, the comparison with the work of Isola is something uh, impressive. <laughs> so. What's your recipe, the front end of the network or the fact that you're using a better loss according to, to your... <laughs> uh. Yeah, I think, uh, I think both, uh, both the loss and the architecture uh, make a difference. Uh, to tell you the truth, I, I, I think the biggest thing that made a difference is that we didn't use GANs. We tried for a couple of months to use GANs and we never got the level of fidelity that we were looking for. And if it, was, was just, if it was just me who tried and failed, I would have said the problem is me. But um, the issue here is that Chifang is a programming champion. He's top 10 in the world at the International Olympiad in Informatics and the ICPC, and he's extremely good at making things work. So after he couldn't get the kinds of results we were looking for with GANs, we figured maybe the problem is not us, and we went for an alternative approach. 